طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So we started talking about uh, public uh, cryptography um, and uh, we talked on message authentication codes and we uh, we mentioned the main objectives of mes message authentication uh, codes uh, providing the uh, data integrity, non-repudiation, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, giving like so some identity of the origin of each message and so on. We then talked about RSA uh, as a general purpose public cryptography algorithm uh, which can be used for multiple things for uh, confidentiality, encryption and decryption and also for key distribution as well as for uh, also providing data integrity. So um, <clears throat> another uh, algorithm for uh, uh, public as, as part of the public cryptography which has been actually uh, uh, developed before RSA, chronologically, يعني, uh, is Diffie Hellman, and as we said, Diffie Hellman uh, can be used solely for uh, key distribution, cannot be used for anything else. And uh, it's based on the uh, discrete uh, logarithm, and we talked about discrete uh, logarithm. So we provided some motivational uh, examples uh, last time. So we said that uh, if, if I want to uh, give you uh, an ex a simple, uh, you know, uh, problem like this and tell you, you know, like if I have A to the power X equals B, for example, and I give you A and B and ask you to get X, so the the solution for this is very easy because X is A is log B divided by log A. So this is the normal uh, uh, logarithm. But if I add to this problem something like this and tell you A, A to the power X mod N equals B, I give you A, N, and B, uh, then this is what we call discrete logarithm, and in order to get uh, X, uh, in many ways we have to resort to exhaustive search, or like some iterative uh, uh, solution. Um, this uh, will be more difficult, uh, and we can add another uh, level of difficulty if I tell you that A is actually a primitive root of B, okay? And what this means is that uh, for each value of X in the exponent, you have different value, value for B, okay? So this means that A is actually a primitive uh, root of uh, B. Uh, so uh, uh, having unique value he here for, e for each value of X uh, makes this problem uh, a little bit more difficult uh, like, for example, if I tell you, like, um, is, is actually 3 a primitive root of uh, 5, for example? So, uh, so uh, in order to prove that 3, for example, is a primitive root of 5, so we say, like, 3 to the power 1 mod 5, this is equal to 3, okay? 3 to the power 2 mod 5, this is a 4. 3 to the power 3, mod 5, this is equals to 27. So this is 2, right? 3 to the power 4, mod 5, this is equal to 1. 3 to the power 4 is actually 81. So that's all good. Mod 5 is actually so as you can see here, if you look at these numbers, these are unique numbers for each value of, and of course, we stop at 4 because uh, 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 this is 5. So we stop at n minus 1, okay? So as you can see here, these values are unique for each value of x. So this means that 3 is actually a primitive root of, uh, uh, of 5. Um, so uh, imagine that these numbers are like 300 digit numbers. Of course, we have to resort to programs and calculators, special calculators to, uh, to calculate that, but it's doable, it's possible, okay? But of course, this would be a very, very, very long list, in which case you have to iterate through all these uh, numbers uh, in order to estimate of x. So that's, that's the theory based on which the Diffie-Hellman is actually uh, based. So 
The way that this uh, mechanism actually works is that we are trying to exchange, uh, because this is key distribution, right? So we're trying to have a common number between Alice and Bob, okay? Such that anyone in between would not be able to, uh, to know the uh, value of this number or the value of this key, okay? So the idea is, 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 is very simple. And here, try to notice the difference with RSA. Um, so uh, the, the, the mechanism works as follows. So um, Alice and Bob share the value of uh, alpha and Q. And here, alpha and Q, unlike uh, uh, Q and, Q and uh, what was it? Alpha and Q, for the case of RSA. For the case of RSA, these are generated locally at Alice and Bob. Here, these numbers are, have to be shared between the two, okay? These values have to be shared between Alice and, and Bob. These are not the key, um, but here, alpha is, in fact, the primitive root of Q. So that's the, uh, that's the first step. And here, what we try to do is that Alice will try to uh, generate YB, uh, that such that YB is actually alpha to the, uh, sorry, we'll generate locally XA. XA here is a private number, which is only known by Alice. So even Bob doesn't know it. No one actually knows X. And the idea here is that even if somebody else has alpha and, and, and Q, they will not be able to guess X. Okay? X is actually a local, uh, locally generated number. And then we try to estimate or calculate YB, which is alpha to the power XA, which is the private key, mod Q. And because of the fact that uh, 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 alpha is actually a primitive root of Q, for each value of XA, we have a unique value YA. Okay? That's not the end of it. No, 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 no. Uh, when they are shared, not, no, not necessarily, no. They can be sent. They can be sent because here, as we said, uh, uh, even if there is any eavesdropper who knows alpha and Q, they don't know X A and, and and necessarily they don't know Y A or so. Uh, y A actually can be can be uh, also shared over the channel. So as we will see here, so alpha and Q are shared through the common channel. Y A is shared through the common channel. But what's actually hidden is XA, the exponent. But for each value of XA, there is YA. So, so if anyone is listening here, they have what? They have alpha, they have Q, and they have YA, right? And that's what we talked about. Even if you have alpha and Q and YA, you cannot guess XA, right? Because this is the discrete logarithm. Okay? So we calculate YA, which is the alpha to the power XA mod Q, and we share this YA. So everybody has YA, everybody has alpha and Q, no, no problem, okay? Uh, Bob, on the other side, also will do the same. It's a symmetric algorithm. So uh, we'll generate also locally XB, X at Bob, and then we'll calculate YB and share it. The idea here is that if you get YB and then you calculate YB to the exponent of XA, which is only known locally, okay? The idea here is that you will get a number, a value, okay? It happens that at Bob, when Bob receives YA and does the same, okay, the answer to this is actually the same value, okay? So this way we can exchange a secret key, okay, without having anyone in the middle being able to know what this key is. And this is due to the fact that we generated the exponent as local values only. Okay? And yeah, of course, the proof for uh, uh, the fact that uh, the value here in both sides is k is very simple. Because this is actually, this is yb to the power xa mod q. And just by doing simple math, we can actually prove that this is, in fact, ya, xb, and so, which is the same number on the other side here, okay? So, using, of course, the multiplicative 
uh, property of the uh, mod. Yeah. So we are like basically selecting a symmetric key from the asymmetric right. uh, method. W what is the asymmetry here? Uh, I mean, the, the, the last key they are sharing, uh, or the result will be the same key. Yes, the result will be the same key, yes. What's actually hidden from both sides is that Bob doesn't right. know XA and Alice doesn't know XB, right? The private and keys. Yes, the private keys on both sides. But it happens that because of the fact that we exchange YA and YB, we will be able to exchange that secret number on both sides without having anyone in the middle to know what this secret key is, okay? So the idea here is simple. Um, so this is, uh, of course, another number of, uh, another, sorry, example of uh, primitive root. So 3 actually is a primitive root of 3, uh, uh, 3, 5, 3. Okay? So if you look at these numbers here, they are generated in any permutation. Doesn't, they don't have to be in sequence, in a specific order, but they have to be unique for each value of, uh, of this exponent. Okay? Type. Uh, so it happens here is that uh, Diffie-Hellman is in fact proof of any passive attack. So if you if you have a passive attacker who is trying to listen, okay, he will get the value of y a and y b. He will get the value of alpha and q, but they will never be able to guess what x a is or what x x b is and as a result, they will never be able to guess K, right? So this is actually for passive attack. But it turns out Diffie-Hellman is extremely prone to active attacks or man-in-the-middle attacks, okay? So, so to prove that, it's very simple because if Darth is in the middle, again, if Darth listens to the traffic, okay, he will get y a y b and he will get all these things, but he will never be able to guess k. But what Darth can do in that case is that Darth can send a value of y d to Alice, okay, and another y d to Bob to force them to a to uh, generate the the key on both sides. So in that case, Darth will communicate to Alice as if he's, he's Bob, will communicate to Bob as if he's Alice, and will generate eight secret keys on both sides, and he knows both of the secret keys, and he will be able to, uh, to break the communication. Okay? So Devi Hellman is actually very prone to a to man in the middle attack. Okay? So what can we do here in order to mitigate this? We do a message authentication codes. Only signature is not enough. Because here, in order for uh, uh, Alice to authenticate herself to Bob, they have to use a message authentication codes. But message authentication codes, in some cases, require a require key, <laughs> require some shared key, right? Because message authentication codes, صح? they use uh, uh, actually uh, keys to, a, to, uh, uh, to exchange or to generate the message authentication codes to uh, engrave or to assign the identity of the sender or the receiver, right? So it's a chicken and egg problem now, right? <laughs> so in order to have message authentication codes, we need a key. But uh, 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 يعني, uh, if, we, uh, if we don't use the key and we try to use Diffie-Hellman for uh, key exchange, we actually need message authentication codes. Okay? So, um, so we'll talk about the solution for this. We'll talk about actually a couple of solutions for this. But keep this in mind that um, Diffie-Hellman is, is actually prone to active attacks. That doesn't mean it's not, it's not being used. In many of the security services that we'll talk about later, you will find that Diffie-Hellman is actually being used because it's actually lightweight compared to uh, RSA, compared to other algorithms. 
Okay. Uh, another uh, standard which has been uh, uh, developed by NIST is what we call uh, Digital Signature Standard, or DSS. DSS was, in fact, standardized just to facilitate the use of uh, SHA-1. We talked about SHA-1 being used as a hashing uh, mechanism, right? So the hashing mechanism on its own is good to generate digital signature, right? So that's why this is called the DSS, Digital Signature Standard. So uh, uh, DSS was, in fact, developed to leverage uh, SHA-1 to generate a digital signature. So that started in 1991. Okay, so NEST developed the first version of DSS. In a later stage, in 96, they actually had to a, to append this uh, standard because at that time, it did not have any, uh, it, it was not a message authentication code. It did not have the identity of the origin. It just generates uh, uh, digest only, digital signature, but it does not, in fact, um, engrave or sign the identity of the origin in that. So, um, so in a later stage, in the uh, uh, later versions, they have actually augmented this standard to include also uh, encryption, okay, to encrypt the hash. So encrypting the hash with the key Okay, so if, if, we, if, if, for example, we use RSA, which means that we use uh, two keys, so in that case, we use which key for uh, generating the message authentication code at the sender side? We use what? Private. The private key, the Zotic. Okay? So, um, so in that case, they did not dictate a certain uh, encryption. It could be anything. So they have, salam So at the at the beginning, this was standardized in 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 FIBS uh, 168-4, which is the first version of the DSS. And in a later stage, they actually augmented that standard to include some encryption algorithm. But they have not dictated a certain um, uh, encryption algorithm in that case, and they left it up to the developer to use whatever. Algorithm. So it could be RSA, it could be elliptic curve, or it could be any other uh, yani proprietary uh, encryption algorithm to generate the message authentication code. So in that case, only here we started to see DSS being used similar to HMAC and CMAC, because HMAC and CMAC, they, ha they, they actually used uh, some message authentication codes, except that HMAC did not use any encryption, right? So HMAC used the secret key as part of the message before hashing. So in that case, we were able to avoid using encryption and decryption. And we said that this is more efficient complexity-wise, right? CMAC on the other side, that, yeah, CMAC used some encryption uh, 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 as part of uh, the message authentication code. Okay? So here, they, uh, uh, they divided the, uh, these two into like two separate uh, stages. On one hand, they use SHA-1 for uh, the hash, and, and the, they have not actually dictated a certain encryption algorithm to uh, generate the message authentication code. So the way that this um, standard actually works is that uh, uh, Bob here, after creating the message, Bob creates the message, and uh, uh, we, uh, Bob uses like uh, SHA1 to create the hash uh, function. And after creating the hash function, uh, he uses like any encryption algorithm to uh, generate the message authentication code, and then appends that to the message as, as usual. And on the other side, Alice will actually split the message and uh, the message authentication code will split that and will uh, uh, will try to generate the hash as if she does not see the uh, the message authentication code and then from that it uses like some kind of a verification algorithm which tries to decrypt okay decrypt the uh, uh, the upcoming hash and then 
perform some comparison. So if it's identical, then uh, this, this message is authenticated and it's not altered, okay? And if it doesn't match, then it, uh, the message is rejected simply, okay? So the DSS ensures all these uh, objectives. So the message was created by a known sender. So we know for a fact that this message has been created by Bob because the secret key is actually uh, used as part of the signature. And the sender cannot deny that, which is part of the non-repudiation, and the message was not altered. So the integrity of the message is preserved. Okay, so there's nothing new. DSS is actually another standard which is pretty much similar to HMAC and CMAC. So there's nothing new here, right? So that's the end of this uh, uh, chapter, and this is the end of actually part one as well. Um, so we, we uh, talked about approaches for message authentication. We talked about message authentication codes and the different objectives that we need to achieve as part of this, including the integrity and non-repudiation, uh, and uh, uh, signing the identity of uh, the origin. We uh, also discussed some uh, hashing uh, mechanism, including the SHA-1 and SHA-2. And we talked about digital signatures. We talked about HMAC and CMAC and the difference between uh, the two. We talked about public cryptography, and we talked about the theory behind each of the uh, public cryptography techniques that we talked about, including RSA uh, uh, and uh, the um, uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, based on the uh, discrete logarithm. Okay? All right, so uh, this is the beginning of uh, part two. Uh, and in part two, we'll start to talk about security services. Uh, so hopefully, uh, people who are doing the dual degree, they will start to see some, uh, uh, some interesting material here, because <laughs> probably for applied cryptography, they have, uh, it's been boring for them. Um, so in part two, we'll start to talk about uh, security uh, services. So here we'll start to talk about uh, key distribution services and user authentication. We talked about the differences between uh, peer entity authentication and message authentication, right? Uh, in previous chapter, we covered uh, the message authentication, right? We, we covered different methods for mes me message authentication codes. And here we'll talk about user authentication. Uh, so user authentication is different because it's done once and for all. It's, it, this is actually the first step that any user would do to try to gain access to uh, any system or resource or database or website or anything. Um, and again, the book here takes the approach of trying to group the concepts based on uh, uh, how they are being used in practice. So, uh, so we'll see that message authentication code is actually the uh, step towards distributing the keys. And in fact, this is like the, the, the front line or the first front line uh, against any attack. So if, if, uh, if someone breaks into the user authentication, they have everything. They can break everything because all the key distribution and all the uh, upcoming, uh, you know, uh, cryptographic techniques, integrity techniques, all of these are actually generated from the user authentication. And we'll see how. Okay. Um, so we'll, uh, again, we'll We'll try to talk first about the user authentication and uh, how it's being used and what are the different types of it. And then we'll jump into uh, key distribution services. Okay. So remote user authentication uh, principles in most computer security contexts, user authentication is the fundamental building block on, and the primary line of defense. As I said, I mean, uh, uh, so for example, I access a website or I access a system using user ID and password. So if somebody tries to uh, take the user ID uh, or, and password and enters the website, everything is open uh, and they can access whatever uh, resource in this system on my behalf. Okay. So user authentication is the basis for most types of access control. By access control here, uh, we mean that the privileges. So if I have a specific user ID and password, then uh, 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 the, any attacker can gain a certain privilege based on my credentials, and he or she can 
actually get different levels of accesses. Taman, the worst one is the system admin who has access to everything. So uh, he can actually destroy the whole system by having access to my user ID and password, Masala. Okay? And, and for that, of course, there is some user accountability. So uh, the, the, according to the access control level, there is some accountability. So again, if, uh, if it's the system admin, the accountability will be, will be more because potentially the attacker can destroy uh, the whole system. In RFC 4949, this is part of EBA, which, which organization? IETF. So IETF is the, uh, is the entity that uses RFCs. They define by user authentication. There are different, slightly different definitions uh, to the user, defini user authentication as a concept. Uh, so the, uh, the, in RFC 4949, the, uh, uh, the Internet Security Glossary, yani, they, they define, or ITF, they define user authentication as the process of verifying an identity claimed by or for a system entity. The idea is that uh, a system uh, uh, tries to claim a certain identity to be able to access the system. Okay? Uh, how can this uh, user claim that? It's through some credentials. And we'll talk about the different types of these uh, credentials, okay? And we'll see that actually this has to be done based on two steps, two separate steps. First, he should give me that identity, and later on, he should claim that identity, okay? So identif identification step, presenting an identifier to the security system. This is part of, the, of what we call registration step. When you sign up to a particular... Uh, 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 vendor or a particular service, like for example, you want to create a new account, Masan, in uh, Google Gmail. Okay, so first you have to sign up. Okay, you give a certain certain information. Uh, you give your name, your number, so on, so on, and so forth. You have to fill all this information. Okay, the system give gives you some proof for this identity in a form of user ID and password in any uh, way, shape, or form. We'll talk about the different types of that. And then there is a verification step. The verification step is when you try to, a, to late, in a later stage, say, I'm Amr. Okay? So you, give, you have to give the proof that you are Amr, and then the system verifies that you are indeed what you say you are. Then you get access to uh, the system. Okay? So these are the two steps. So first step is usually done at any point of time offline, so to try to actually uh, provide your identity to the system, and later on claim that identity. Um, so the identification step, depending on the system, can be very loose or can be very, very, very rigorous. For example, you, you cannot imagine that uh, uh, the registration or the identification step for, for uh, Google service to access, for Gmail or something, uh, you cannot imagine that you provide the same level of information like uh, when you present yourself in a bank. Those are totally, or for example, to uh, uh, immigration department. Okay, so here this uh, identification step is totally different. So in, in many cases, as we uh, see even nowadays, they require the fact that you take all your IDs and take a picture while you are holding all your IDs and then present everything to the system. And then somebody in the back scene, they will have to verify that this is exactly the same shape of the person and uh, it actually uh, overlaps or it's identi identical to the ID that you are holding and so on and so forth. And then and only then they give you e uh, uh, access, right? Um, but in different, in other systems like Google service or something, it's very loose. So even many of us, they have multiple uh, Gmail email or something like that. So you can provide whatever information. So it can be very loose or it can be very, very tight. Um, so Nest, unlike IETF, Nest, they have yeah, any different but similar uh, definition to uh, uh, user authentication. So they define in uh, SP 800-63, not that we have to uh, actually memorize this, they define electronic user authentication as the process of establishing confidence 
in the user uh, identities that are presented electronically, okay, uh, in a later stage, yani, to the information system in order to gain access, okay? So systems can use authenticated identity to determine if the authenticated individual is authorized to perform a particular uh, function, like by accessing a certain resource, certain part of the system, a database, a anything like that. So in many cases, the authentication and transaction or, or ordered uh, authentic or authorized function take place across an open network. That's the problem, Ba. This is the problem. Because if it's, uh, if I exchange my credentials or my identity to the system through open network, okay, you cannot imagine that, مثلا, I can send my password as a plain text over uh, the open network, صح? So there has to be a special uh, a process to do that. Whereas if I'm in a private network or in a local machine, okay, so just to log on, log on to a local uh, process or a local machine, maybe it's not, it's not as critical, although even in that case also they are not using the uh, plain text of the password, right? Uh, in many cases, they use also other techniques. Uh, but يعني, exchanging these credentials on a local machine or uh, a private network is different from uh, 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 using or sharing that across open networks. So th these are two, two different things. So this is the security model, which is uh, actually uh, defined by uh, NIST in this uh, document. And as we'll see later, some of this terminology is actually when it comes to actual uh, development of security services, they use different terminology, more or less. But the idea here is that, again, we have two separate stages. There is, this is the identification stage, and this is the verification stage. So the identification stage is like the sign-up or the registration step. So this is usually done offline at any point of time before being able to access the system and trigger this verification step, okay? So this is the subscriber or the claimant. The claimant is like the one who claimed this identity, okay? A subscriber is more on this side and a claimant is more on this side. Somebody who claims that this is my identity, right? So a subscriber on this side will start by first user registration. And this is usually the first step. So the user registration, I start to dump or I start to give all my information to a particular registration authority, which could be like the uh, 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 Gmail message WhatsApp. Okay? You, enter, you, you, you go into Gmail, and then they, uh, uh, the website starts to, uh, to receive your identification information, right? This identification information will, in turn, go to um, a credential service provider. This credential service provider is the one who's responsible for providing the proof for you, okay, to be used later on, okay? And this, uh, uh, this is, for example, what we call, I'm not sure if you know this term, LDAP. LDAP, like, is a, it could be like a common service, okay, which runs in the back scene of the distributed system, which all the services, they try to, e, to go to that uh, centralized uh, process to get some uh, proof for, for this registration, okay? Uh, so this could be Gmail, okay? But actually, this service provider can be a common thing for all Google services because Google has different services, right? As like Gmail and other things, okay? So it goes to this uh, uh, service provider, and the service provider will give you, like, some identity proof, okay, that indeed, okay, so your registration is fine, and I can really verify that this is your identity. I believe you in some, yeah, I mean, in some way, <laughs> okay, and this way could, be, again, be loose or could be very, very tight, okay, and then this identity proofing will be provided to the subscriber. Okay, so now the subscriber has the proof that his identification is stored to be able to access a particular service. Okay, so the claimant now, which is the same person as the subscriber, will in a later stage 
try to, uh, to uh, uh, present this uh, identity or uh, claim this identity through some authenticated protocol and will provide this to a verifier, okay? And the verifier will, so this is step number one, will exchange our credentials to the verifier. The verifier, of course, exchanges this proof of identity from the, from the provider, right? Um, and the verifier will, will check what you provide in terms of credentials, will match, will say, okay, so everything is fine. So it will provide some authenticated decision to the relying party. The relying party here is the actual service that you are trying to do. Uh, so you're trying, for example, to log on to Gmail. So now you will present your user ID and password. And this exchange protocol could be like one step, could be two steps, especially for uh, two-factor authentication, Masalan, for example, if I want to access uh, Blackboard, right? So it's not enough to provide user ID and password. Then Blackboard will, I'm not sure if this happens to you, but it happens to us. Yes. Usually, uh, students are more trusted more than the faculty members. So, uh, so for us, we get back like uh, some uh, 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 text box that we have to enter a six-digit uh, uh, number. Uh, surprisingly, my bank account uses only four digits, but now we have to present six digits uh, number, <laughs> which is really interesting. And uh, and then and only then we get verified, and then we gain access to that particular uh, service. So once we get that particular uh, uh, verification, now we have authenticated session, right? So the, uh, the, this, uh, this, this whole thing or whole procedure is for actually this, okay? Once we have this authenticated session, this means that we can start communicating between the, the claimant and the relying party or the service, halas, we, 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 we communicate directly. We don't need all these other entities anymore. Okay? So these are the two steps. It could be yes, yes, yes. So all of these are logical entities. Okay? During implementation, they can be combined into one, one process. Or they could be actually on two different processes on the distributed system, right? But they exchange, or they both exchange or they both actually access a certain database, something like that, okay? So this, this whole thing is like logical. During implementation, it's up to uh, the system developer to design these entities, whether separate, combined, things like that, okay? In some cases, by the way, also the registration authority and the service provider is actually one, one process. Could be, okay? So you can combine any of these entities, but in the standard, they define these as separate logical entities. Any other questions? So this is generic, by the way. In a later stage, we'll start to change the terminology. Is it like accessing something more specific? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. There is a lot of details, but yes, what you say actually sums it up. Yes, exactly. That's why I said yes, offline. It happens on, uh, offline once and for all. Yes. Once you get the identity proofing, you can use it many, many, many times. But yes. That that's true, and we'll see. Like uh, we, we'll talk about the details of this. As we said, this will will become clearer in a later stage. What you're saying is perfectly right. So usually, user authentication. Uh, 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 is done to implement or to develop or to establish uh, a session. But this session is usually long term. This session is to access the basic service, okay? But in order to have a particular service, you may actually have to establish another session. And this session is temporary, is like for a temporary period of time. So we'll see how this is done. We said before we, uh, so here, what we, uh, what we have here is like is a token or credential. This is actually the identity proofing way. So I can provide you with a token. Uh, I'm not sure if you know what token is. Or uh, for example, token, you can think of it as, it could be actually a physical device, or it could be 
a printed uh, barcode which is like encrypted. It's like a ticket of a cinema or something, okay? Uh, or it could be actually a physical device. So, uh, for example, when I used to work in IBM in Canada, they used to give us like a, a small device, an actual physical device, which has like a, a, a random number that appears with like some duration of time. So at any point of time, if you want to present yourself to the system, you have to enter this, which is now is similar to actually sending a, a random code to your device. And so in the past, it was not like as sophisticated as now. So they used to give us actually a physical device that has this uh, uh, code generated uh, temporarily, and it, uh, it stays like fixed for a, a very small duration of time, and then it changes. So every time you have to enter the system, you have to actually present that uh, code as another verifier in addition to your user ID and password. Okay? Okay? Type. There are four bad general means for authenticating a user. So when we say, go ahead. So, so for these credentials, ba, yani hina, ba, uh, type. So there are four uh, general means for authenticating a user identity which can be used alone or combined. Okay, for example, we can use multiple uh, ways of verifying the identity of the user. So it could be something the user knows, like for example, password, like pen number. Okay, could be something the individual possesses, as I said, uh, which is like uh, uh, electronic uh, key card or um, it could be like a smart card or physical device, okay? Or it could be your cell phone, and you have, you own like a certain number, so I can send you a code on this number or something. So this is something the user actually possesses. Or it could be something the user is, like your iris, okay? So uh, there is like ongoing research, for example, to use the biometrics uh, for uh, identifying a person. So in order to access a system, for example, you can just look at the device and it actually verifies your iris. In some cases, they use EEG. Uh, whatever means to actually identify the person. So this is something the user is. Okay? Or it could be something the user does, uh, like, for example, voice pattern. Uh, a system can actually ask you to, to speak for a certain duration of time, and then they identify through you the the, the voice uh, pattern, okay? Or some, sometimes through even the keystrokes. Something like that. Okay? Type. So, uh, 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 symmetric key distribution here talks about the fact that we need to distribute uh, symmetric keys, which means, like, it's the same key, right? So, uh, uh, so we can do that using... Uh, uh, um, as we said, one of the ways to distribute the keys is to, in fact, encrypt it using another key, right? We talked about that before. So uh, this actually uh, uh, is, in many ways, is used to generate, like, there is a master key that it should have been exchanged before, okay? And one way of exchanging that master key is through public cryptography, because in public cryptography, uh, we use two keys, right? So we have already two keys at every individual user, right? So each user has public key and private key, okay? So if I want to exchange some, something with any of you, then I can use my, uh, 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 I can use the person's public key, okay, and encrypt something and give it to you. And you do the same using, your pub, using my public key. You send me that key and... Now we have a symmetric key exchange on, e on both sides, okay? But that requires the fact that we should have uh, public key cryptography. But here, ba, interestingly speaking, what we need to do is we need to, to do like symmetric key distribution using symmetric cryptography or symmetric encryption, okay? So this means that pr prior to distributing the keys, we should have a symmetric key, but how? How can we have this symmetric key, okay, in order to uh, 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 distribute another symmetric key, okay? So there are, uh, so the two parties must share the same key, 
and that key must be protected from access by others. So frequent key, ex frequent key changes are usually desirable. As we said before, uh, the, the hacking is always possible, right? What will make the cost of the hacking uh, really hard? One of the ways is actually that you have to renew or to limit the lifetime of the key. Uh, so uh, uh, the attacker will for sure get or guess the key, but the duration of time that the attacker needs using the most of secure device is actually more than the lifetime of that key. So by the time he guesses the key, I actually knew the key, so he, <laughs> so he didn't gain anything, okay? So if we change that key frequently, then we avoid any kind of, a, uh, of attack. So uh, one of the ways of doing that is, as I said, we have a master key, okay, which we will say in a minute how we can share that master key. And we use that master key to exchange a temporary key. This temporary key will be valid for sometimes actually as, as, uh, as short as like 30 seconds or one minute maximum. Okay, and after that, I have to send another temporary key, and so on, okay? So if I can do that frequently, then I can avoid any kind of attack. So there is, uh, there are two techniques here. There is the key distribution techniques, and there is the key management techniques. By key distribution technique here, we mean that how we can, how we can distribute these keys to the different parties, and here, in general, you can imagine that we have a distributed system of multiple entities or multiple users or multiple devices, and they are trying to communicate with each other. Okay? How can we have each two parties in this distributed system to share the same key in order to facilitate the communication? So that's the key distribution technique. And there's also the key management technique. The key management technique here, like, is imagine that, that we that we have like a centralized server which manages all these keys. Manages all these keys, okay? Uh, this entity is the one that says, okay, so you can take that key and you can take that key and then you can talk and so on. So uh, given a large number of keys, like imagine by that we have, mesela like the, this service provider that we just talked about, this service provider receives all the requests for, for, for user registrations, and they have to provide like some identity proofing, which could be like in a form of certain keys or certain identification. So the key management this, uh, uh, technique here, given a large, sorry, given large set of keys, so you have different keys here, okay? How do we preserve their safety and make them available as needed? And what that means is we can actually, uh, uh, in a centralized server, generate a large random sequence huh? using pseudo-random functions. We talked about this, right? We, we can generate pseudo-random uh, uh, sequence, uh, which could be as long as we want, right? Because we said that the length is, uh, is actually unlimited, theoretically, okay? So we can use pseudo-random function to generate very large, uh, 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 you know, random sequence, and, that, and, and then break this random sequence into different keys, and then we can give these keys to, a, to, to the different entities. But we have to be careful, because if this random sequence is very large, there will be some a correlation between these keys. So if one key is, in fact, broken, this will allow the attacker to guess the other keys easily, and in that case, he can break the system easily, right? So that's one when we have to, to preserve the safety of these keys. So we have to make sure that whatever keys are being currently used in the distributed systems, they have to have no correlation whatsoever between each other, okay? So that if one link is broken, it doesn't affect the whole system, right? So that's when uh, uh, we need special design to preserve the safety uh, of uh, generating these keys and how to manage it. Type. So how can we uh, uh, provide that or how can we support that key distribution? 
Actually, we can break now and we can uh, we can come later. So, right, so uh, uh, some basic يعني, methods we can use for uh, key distribution uh, between two parties. So the key can be selected by A and physically delivered to B. What is the example of this from uh, from from our live now? Um, I'm not sure if it happens here, but like some in, in some countries, you get actually the pen number delivered to your mailbox uh, physically. Um, so, uh, uh, like the the credentials or the key or whatever identification uh, number can be physically delivered from one person to another, <clears throat> or a third party can select a key and physically deliver it to A and B, okay? Uh, which is like the bank or something, uh, or any kind of third party. So this is like uh, the physical way of delivering the, the key. If A have previously and recently used a key, which is what we said, like could be a master key, okay? One party could transmit the new key to the other using the old key. So this old key is like the master key, or it could be the public key or the, on, uh, to the other uh, side. Okay, So we can use that old key to encrypt the new key and then deliver it to uh, the other person. Okay, The same method can happen through some third party. So a third party can, in fact, uh, uh, generate that key, and then uh, you have a secure channel. Like, so, um, so, for example, Alice and Bob, there is, like, a, a third party here. So Alice previously has, like, a secure channel with this third party. And Bob also has a secure channel uh, with this third party. So this third party can, in fact, generate the key and send it over to here and here through that secure channel. You see? So this secure channel can, in fact, how is this secure? Through like some uh, public key or through some exchange symmetry key uh, 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 from before. Okay, so these are the four ways. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll try to talk about, about uh, key distribution service. Uh, this is the first protocol that we uh, talk about. So uh, there are two types of keys for, uh, uh, for this option four. As we said, the key could be like a session key or a permanent key. A session key has the nature of being temporary which is valid only for a short period of time. Okay? Um, so uh, a permanent key bar is used for a long period of time. And uh, just the fact that it's permanent doesn't mean that it's like forever. Uh, so it could be also for a large duration of time. So what typically happens is that like when you, when you first try to access the system, okay, you get a permanent key or a semi-permanent key. This permanent key will be valid for the entire uh, uh, communication with the system. Okay? And every now and then, you have to create a, a, another session key, which is valid only for accessing a particular service for a small duration of time. And then after some time, you, you have to renew that key. So this is the difference between the session key and the permanent key. There is the concept of key distribution center, which actually matches the third party that we talked about. So this key distribution center grants two systems to establish a connection, A and B, or Alice and Bob, okay? And provides one-time session key. So you have a permanent or a semi-permanent key with the key distribution center, and this is valid for a very, very large duration of time, okay? 
And then using that uh, 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 semi-permanent key to communicate with the key distribution center, the key distribution center can now generate locally a shared key and then give it to both Alice and Bob. So when host, when host A wishes to set up a connection to B, it actually transmits a connection request to the key distribution center. The key distribution center, based on this request, will generate a shared key and then will give it to, A, to Alice and Bob. So if the, if the key distribution center approves the request, what does it mean that it approves the request? This means that uh, in order for A to send that request, it has to authenticate itself to the key distribution center. Okay? It has to first authenticate itself. And that could happen through like some user authentication uh, mechanism. Okay? It generates a unique one-time session key and then it delivers it to A and B. A and B can now, A and B can now set up a logical co connection and exchange messages for a short duration of time. Okay? So when, when the key distribution center exchanges that key, with it, it actually exchanges the lifetime of that key. Uh, we'll see that in a minute, how this is done. Okay, so after this duration of time, then A has to e send another request to the key distribution center to get another key and so on. Type this, this slide I actually added just to motivate you or to try to make you think about uh, the complexity because we, we said that uh, <coughs> the, the, the key distribution can happen symmetrically or asymmetrically, right? So, uh, uh, so there is, as we said before, there is a misconception that uh, public key cryptography, they have no overhead when it comes to uh, key distribution. But this is, in fact, not true. And we will, we will validate that and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, the complexity or the overhead of how to exchange even the public key. So uh, public key, just the fact that everybody uh, may actually know the public key doesn't mean that I can just send it like this. Okay, so we'll see how this is done. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not trivial. It's not zero overhead. Um, but just imagine that we have, like we have a distributed system of, uh, n different nodes, okay? So we have a distributed system of n different nodes. In order for me to, uh, uh, to have symmetric key distribution, this means that any two entities in order to be able to communicate, they have to have the same key. So what is the complexity here if I have n different nodes? It's, it's any, any two parties want to communicate with each other, then they need to have uh, a shared key, which means that we have uh, n combination two, okay? So this is actually n times n minus one divided by two. Okay, anyone not following how this is, how we get this? So this is very, very simple, right? So this is O of A, N square, right? So this is O of N square. So in order to have like a distributed system of N nodes, we need a complexity of N square keys to be exchanged. Of course, if we talk about uh, multicast, it's a different story. Multicast, like you, you need better to manage group keys and so on, so which is, a little bit more complicated. So in addition to the point-to-point uh, -point keys, you need to have group keys as well, okay? For public, for public cryptography, we need uh, a, a public key and a private key at each node, okay? And any two nodes want to communicate, one should have the public key of all the nodes, okay? So that's, that's done once and for all. Okay, so everybody will have the public key of everybody, okay? And whenever I want to send a message to node X, I need to use the public key of that, of that node. So the complexity here is like each node will have a two keys, which means that the number of keys that I need totally, the number of keys that I need totally is, is actually a 2N, which means that it's of N, okay? So the, 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 in terms of number of keys, Definitely, the public uh, cryptography is less complex, which is true. But that doesn't mean it's, it's the overhead is zero. And as we will see, in order to exchange the public keys, we, in fact, need to uh, uh, spend some overhead. So we'll see how this, how this is done. 
Okay. Um, so the idea now is that what is the motivation of using symmetric key if public key uh, is less complex in terms of uh, the number of keys that we need is because of the fact that for the same size of, of the key, symmetric key is less complex in terms of operation. So in terms of encryption and decryption, the symmetric key is actually less complex for the same size of the key. What, Hadi? Okay. Tayyip. So now we'll start to talk about the, f the first uh, uh, security service, uh, which is called Kerberos. And Kerberos here is named after uh, like a Greek, a Greek name. It doesn't, doesn't matter, yeah, I mean, historically. Yeah, I mean. And this was developed by MIT. So uh, this Kerberos, it assumes like a distributed environment, distributed system, distributed system of uh, uh, different nodes, n different nodes. Okay. Uh, some of these nodes could could be uh, servers. Okay, uh, probably one of these nodes is designated as a centralized management control or something. So we'll see what, what are the different terminologies of this. So this will be the key manager for, for, uh, 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 for all the nodes, all the other nodes. Okay. Um, and we have other uh, uh, devices, which each device can be used as uh, a service server like email server, web server, things like that. And the idea here is that we have some other devices or workstations where uh, uh, normal users need to authenticate themselves to this workstation. And through the workstation, which, is, which becomes a client, uh, I need to access other servers in that distributed system, whether it's a web server or email or something like this. So this is the normal scenario that we use on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> so nerve, servers need to uh, restrict access to authorized users, so we can ensure that by using credentials, normal credentials like user ID and password. But as we said before, we have to pay attention to the fact that uh, for user authentication, we cannot send the password as plain text over open channel. So that's a challenge now. We cannot send that, that password over uh, 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 an unsecured channel. But in fact, so in order to use the key, we have to first do the user authentication before creating the key. Okay, so how do we do that uh, without having to send the, the password as uh, plain text? So a workstation cannot be trusted to uh, identify its users correctly to the network service because a user may gain access to a particular workstation and pretend to be another user operating from that, uh, from that workstation. So what this tries to say here is that you have, you have a workstation, okay, and you have a user who tries to access a system, okay, uh, through that workstation. So that user tries to log on to this workstation, and this workstation now becomes a client to access any service from that system, OK? So now, if another user comes and somehow gains, uh, 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 compromises the credentials of that user, that attacker may, in fact, access the workstation pretending that he or she is actually the legitimate user and tries to access the system on his or her behalf. So that scenario needs to be mitigated and avoided, OK? Which means that, of course, this user cannot simply send the password as plain text, because that user will have to will, 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 will get it easily, and, and then in a later stage can log into the workstation. So a user may alter the network address of a workstation. So when I try to access this system through the, a particular workstation, okay, the system grants access to this particular user on a, on a specific workstation. Okay, so when I try to access a website, the website will grant me access based on the fact that I'm coming from a specific workstation. So what is the identifier for a workstation? IP, IP address. Okay. Type. Having said that, what we could do is that we can have the same attacker now 
accesses another machine and then updating this machine to have the same IP address like this machine and from that machine he tries to access the system. <laughs> okay, so that scenario also needs to be a mitigated and avoided. Okay, so it doesn't have to happen on the same machine. It could happen on another machine and we can uh, 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 pretend or uh, change that particular uh, machine's address to uh, gain access to the system. And of course, the normal, the normal uh, uh, scenario, which is like a user may eavesdrop on exchanges and, and use replay attack. So even if I don't have access to the user DM password, even if I don't have access to another workstation, I can simply, I can simply copy a certain message here, which I know that it has the authentication information, okay? Even if it's encrypted and I don't know what's inside, so it could be encrypted, I could be actually, uh, uh, it could have message authentication code, could be secure in all aspects, right? And all I need to do is just to get a copy of this message and replay it. Okay? So this way I can corrupt the communication. I can corrupt the communication between that user and the system. So what is the mitigation for replay attacks? We talked about this. Timestamp, bravo alik. Allah hain fi nas bitzakir al matiya. Or, or sequence numbers, simply sequence numbers. I can use any kind of identifier or uh, uh, timestamp that ensures the freshness of the of the message. So if you try to, of course, this timestamp should be encrypted. Ba. Okay. So if the timestamp is encrypted, when the user here, any user here, receives that message and tries to decrypt it, then uh, uh, he or she will look at the timestamp. If the timestamp is something in the past, then it knows that this message is not fresh and it rejects it. So this way I can mitigate the, the replay attack easily. So these scenarios we need to, to mitigate. So now we need to ensure that there will be no spoofing of IP addresses. We need to make sure that password is not uh, sent uh, as plain text we need to make sure that the message contains some kind of uh, a timestamp or something like this that ensures the freshness of, uh, of the message. So these are basically things that we need to ensure as part of this protocol. So, <clears throat> so Kerberos is uh, a key distribution which is solely based on symmetric uh, cryptography. There is no public uh, cryptography here at all. So it provides a centralized authentication service. So there is, as we said, like there is a, a centralized server, which what we call the, the, which what we named it before, the service provider for the identity proofing. So there is a centralized server that, that is used for authenticating the user to access any basic information in the system. Uh, so <clears throat> it relies exclusively, as we said, on uh, symmetric encryption, making no use of public encryption at all. And this is a challenge, as we will see. This is actually a challenge, because typically, if you use the public uh, cryptography, it's actually perfect for, uh, the, for a key distribution as part of the uh, user authentication. It makes, it makes the operation uh, simpler. And we'll see many services later on that uses that concept. So there are two versions of Kerberos. There is first version 4 and version 5. Version 4 implementation still exists, although this version is being phased out. And this is like, for example, the only difference between them is that uh, version 4 is maybe like it, it uses this. And as we said before, this itself is OK. But the, the problem with this is that it's easy breakable, not because of this, but because of the, of the key size, right? And also, this is, is highly complex because it's, uh, it's not software friendly. So uh, because of these motivations, they have uh, 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 deprecated version 4, and they try to use version 5, which recommends using something like uh, AES or something, or more efficient uh, encryption algorithm. Najika? Type. So in terms of basic terminology for, uh, for Kerberos, it uses the authentication server. 
the authentic authentication server is this is the centralized user authentication uh, entity okay so this uh, 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 this is the server that uses that is used initially to negotiate the user authentication to access the basic service to the system, to any part of the system okay so with that it gives you it gives you like a a ticket okay which is valid only to access the ticket granting server okay the ticket granting server is another logical entity which now tries to give you a service specific access to a particular service so an example of this an example of this is like when you log on to google masalan so the first step is is that once you log on the system actually tries to authenticate you on two steps first it gives you access to basic google services okay so this is service agnostic so you are authenticated as a basic user okay to have basic access and then another step is to say oh okay so when you log on you try to log on to gmail so I need to give you access to actually Gmail. So it sends the authenticated request to another server, which is the ticket granting server, to, a, to give you access to Gmail. Another example yani from the real life is like, first, you want to watch a movie. The first thing you do, you go to the cinema. In the cinema, you have many, many movies are being you know, uh, played, right? So first, you can think of this as, of these two steps as, like first you have to pay, okay, and then you get a ticket. This ticket is actually to give you basic access to the cinema. And then you can watch any of these movies. Then you get to a particular movie and say, okay, so I have access to watch a movie. Then you say, they tell you, okay, so do you want to watch this movie? Yes, okay, so in that case, it's like we, we can get this basic ticket and we give you another ticket to watch that particular movie. Okay, what have So these are the two uh, steps, and this uh, this is how these two logical entities are you are being used. First, the authentication server is to provide the basic user authentication, and it gives you grant to the basic service of the system. Then it gives you like a a ticket, which is valid for a certain period of time to access the basic service from a particular workstation, and this ticket can only be presented to the ticket granting server. And the ticket granting server can now give you a specific access to a particular uh, server or uh, Gmail server or email or database or something like this. Okay? So these have to happen through two steps. Mashikela? So for version 4, it uses this, as we said. Like version 5, you use another very efficient, another more efficient uh, technique, such as AES or something. Type. Type. So this particular uh, scenario has some, uh, uh, some issues or some challenges that we need to discuss. So if user, if user C <laughs> logs on to a workstation in the morning and wishes to check his or her email, at server V, okay? So the solution now is that C authenticates through the uh, 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 authentication server, and as we said, to get a ticket to the ticket granting server, and from the ticket granting server, we get access. It has to be done on two steps. We'll see how. But then I got the ticket to access that email server. But C must use a password to get that ticket, right? So in order to actually to present myself to the authentication server, I have to give the password. But how can I give the password uh, as, as plain text to the server? So that's a challenge. That's a challenge, or this is like a, something we have to solve, <coughs> okay? So if C wishes to check the mail se se several times, it shouldn't have to do all these overhead over and over and over and over again, right? So uh, if, I, if I exit the movie to try to uh, buy some cop popcorn or something, I shouldn't have to pay again, yani, صح? So as long as my ticket is valid, 
I should be able to just uh, re-enter again, right? So I can access the mail server over and over again for a certain period of time. But if the ticket is expired, then I have to go back. So we know how to resolve this, but there has to be certain mechanism to resolve this. So the workstation can store the mail server ticket, and the mail server ticket uh, uh, embeds in it uh, that this user wants to access the email server from this workstation for a duration of time. Imagine? All of this is actually stored in the ticket. And remember, the ticket cannot be even copied by the user. Yani when, you, when you enter the cinema, if you can copy the ticket, then there's no point to pay, sah? <laughs> so the ticket itself is not forgeable even by the user. So the, even the user does not know what's inside this ticket. So it's like the ticket is encrypted with a private key that only known by the entity that issued that ticket. Type. So the user would need a, a new ticket for every service like email and printing. So how we can make this process also? So I, that's why we have to split it on two stages. Because then we can use the basic ticket that we received from the authentication server, okay? And now present it to the ticket granting server and say, now I want to gain access to another service. I don't have to perform user authentication again. Yani if I have to present my credentials every time I use a service, it will be annoying to me. And yani imagine you, like you click on a link and then you get presented by, uh, okay, now you have to do two-factor authentication again. You click on another link, oh, now we have to do. So just the fact that it's a different service, it doesn't mean that I have to do the user authentication again and again and again. Okay, and that's why we have to split it into two parts. So I have a basic ticket through which I can access this system for a long duration of time, regardless of, of whatever service I want to access. Mexico? So the ticket granting server is needed so the user can get a ticket for each service without having to do the user authentication every now and then. Are you following? If anybody is not following, what's coming next is, is actually more, uh, yani, uh, more difficult to follow. Okay? So we don't, we don't want to lose anyone. Type. So it looks complicated, but it's simple. It's not, it's not that uh, hard. Yani. So now we have a workstation. So this is the start. This is step number one. So this is the start. We have a workstation, and we have a user. And this user logs on on the workstation to request a service. This service is on a host, and this is the host. But in order for us to do that, as we said, we have to do the authentication. And authentication is done on, a, on two steps. So this is, this is step number one, and this is step number two. OK? So this is step number one on to the authentication server and the ticket granting server. And after these two steps, I can gain access to, a, to the service or the host that I want to access. Very simple. This is the over, overview of this uh, uh, graph. Uh, I have to also mention that just the fact that we're talking about two logical entities, it doesn't mean, as we said before, it doesn't mean that these have to be uh, uh, on, on two physical machines. They could be like uh, running as processes on the same machine. Yeah. So the authentication server and the ticket granting server could in fact be uh, processes that run on the same machine. There's no restriction. Type. So, so the first thing is that the user will have to, to log on. But as we said, the user, when, when he tries to log on, does not present the, he can present the user ID, no problem. But he cannot present the password as plain text. OK? So this has to be resolved. So somehow the request should contain the user ID for sure, but it should not contain the password as plain text. Yeah. So we'll see how this is done. So the user sends that request with the user ID without sending the password as plain text. And somehow he gets two things. Okay, He gets two things. He gets a ticket 
this ticket again is to access the basic service, any basic service, okay? And a session key which allows that workstation to communicate to the ticket granting server for a certain duration of time. So the ticket, both the ticket and the session key will have to be used in the next step. The session key is to be used to encrypt the request. So the only the only part that is not encrypted is a is the first request which sends the user authentication, which includes the user ID, but not the password as plain text. Okay? That's the only part that's not encrypted. Because we don't have a key yet to encrypt anything. So from now on, all the messages after that are encrypted with a key. This key, this key is the result of the first step of the user authentication. Assuming that the user authentication initial request is done successfully, then we get the session key. And even the session key, I cannot just send it as plain text, صح? So when, when I say ticket plus the session key, this message should actually be encrypted, صح? But encrypted with what key, ba? Anshuf. <laughs> okay. أنا بس ب ب بعم سسبنس شوية عشان الناس تقبل. So we use that key to encrypt the request going to the ticket granting server to try to request access to a to a particular service. And then again in the result we'll get a ticket and a session key. The ticket will allow us to present it to the particular. Uh, service that we want to access to mark the fact that this user on this workstation wants to access email service for a certain duration of time. And the session key is to be used to encrypt the message or any communication between the user and this particular service server. So, so this is actually a, the overview of how this uh, 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 protocol works. So now uh, we'll dig down and try to see the content of all these messages that are being exchanged. So this is, this is actually about the protocol. The protocol, when you talk about any protocol in any layer, we talk about message format, and certain messages are being sent between uh, the entities. And in any of these messages, you always have to ask yourself, what is this field used for? Because if the answer is that it's not used for anything, then it should have been removed. Just the fact that it's there, it has to have a, a function. So always ask yourself, what is the, the usage of this particular field, the message? Why it's actually formatted this way? Any question before we move? <clears throat> so this is how we exchange uh, uh, the, uh, the requests and how we can gain access to a particular uh, service. So again, nothing is new here. It's just that we try to see, we try to open back the, the messages and we see what's inside and why we have uh, uh, these fields inside this message. What is the purpose of each field in this message? Because there is some... يعني, uh, idea behind it. Taib. Again, these are the two steps. This is, uh, this is, in fact, step number one. And this is step number two. And from that on, we have the communication with the service server, which could be like email or something. So hey, here we have like some uh, subscripts. So uh, again, we have C to, uh, 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 to represent the user. And we have the uh, ticket granting server, TGS. And we have uh, V, V here, to represent the server uh, which we try to access. Could be like email server or something. So V here refers to the service server. And TGS refers to the ticket granting server. And C refers to the user. 
So here I, 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 I like to differ a slightly uh, from the book, and I will tell you why. It's not actually a big difference, but يعني, just to make the discussion consistent. So this message, I like to start with ID TGS, and then IDC, and then the timestamp one. It's the same, but it is. Uh, the reason for this is that we always try to present the target uh, uh, server in the beginning. So it's like the user tries to say, I want to access the ticket granting server, and here is my authenticator. So these two are the authenticator for the user. Authenticator for the user uh, are presented by the user ID, which is IDC, okay, and a timestamp. Timestamp here is for what? Hmm? To mitigate replay attack. So together we call it an authenticator for the user. And that's that's the only message that is not encrypted in this whole thing. Okay? And there is nothing to encrypt. Meshi, I want to access the ticket granting server. I know the ID. And here is my user ID. And here's we don't have any password here. We don't have any password here. Meshi? So there is no issue. What will happen is that the authentication server, the authentication server will send us a puzzle. Okay? Will send us an encrypted message. Maybe. This encrypted message is actually encrypted with KC. What is this KC? Where, where did it come from? Public key all the time? No. Public, no, no, it's not, we're, using, we're not using public keys. Any guess? Eh? No, 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 IDC is the username. It's not to be used as, as a password. This is, this is in fact, this is in fact a result of pseudo random function of Password of C, hashed password of C. Okay? So, the, of course, authentication server knows the password, صح? It should. I have to, I have to have had the registration done before, otherwise, يعني خلاص ما, I don't. And now I'm, I'm trying to claim access, right? So the server has the password. Okay, so what the server could do is that the server can pull the my password from its database, and in fact, even the even the password cannot be stored on the database as plain text. We know that it gets stored as hash value, صح? And as we said, the hash value does not have re reversibility, and in fact, one of the conditions of the hash is that the reversibility is computationally infeasible, صح? So it's a one time or one direction hash, صح? So uh, the server has it, has the hash value of the password, okay? So the server can use pseudo random function, okay? To generate a password, sorry, to generate a key based on the password, okay? And use that key to encrypt the message back. So this is KC, okay? So if the user has the right password, he or she will be able to decrypt this message using KC. Because the user can, so pseudo random function, as we said, pseudo random function, if we use the same algorithm, we can reach the same random. This is, in fact, the, the theory based on which RC4 is based. <laughs> Two users are trying to generate the same random sequence. At the same time, they should be able to, A, to generate the same random sequence as long as they start from the same C which is, in that case, a, the password, okay? So if they have the same password, then they will reach the same KC, in which case the user will be able to decrypt that message type. That message contains what, as we said, contains two very important things. Contains the ticket to be able to access the ticket granting server, which is like the basic uh, service, and a session key. So this session key is this. So this is part of the message. So this key 
is part of the actual message, right? So this is K C T G S. So this is this means like it's a session key to be used for communication between the user and the ticket granting server. Nashi? And I D T G S, which is the identifier for for which is remember it's actually here. Sah? And uh, a timestamp two. This time this timestamp two is used is used for what again? Replay it. So I have to maintain the timestamp in all these messages to mitigate the. So maintaining the timestamp gets rid of a of the possibility of replay attack. Maybe? So now we answer two questions, which is like, password is not exchanged as plain text, and now we have the solution for that, and we have the timestamp, which mitigates the part of replay attack. So that's fine. Maybe? But I, ID, TGS, why do we have to send it back? This is what I'm saying by, yeah, and you have to ask yourself, why, yeah, why? And I'm sending you something, you're giving me the same thing. Why? Maybe? You, have to, you have to have this type of mentality. You have to question what you see. Maybe? Type. Now, we have the session key. We can now use it to encrypt any kind of messages coming on to use the KCTGS to encrypt a message to go to the ticket granting server. So to the ticket granting server, I'm saying that I need this request is going to the ticket granting server. I'm saying that I need to access this target server, which is like email server, meshi. And here is my ticket, and here is my authenticator. Meshi. The authenticator part that is encrypted. We will see now. So I'm pre I'm presenting my request. So I need to access the email service. And here is the ticket, which grants me this access. And here is my authenticator in order for you to make sure that, indeed, I'm the one who, who, who is saying that or claim my identity. And the results will, will be encrypted using the session key. And in that session key, I will send Eva another session key to access or to use for communication with the email server. And again, I have to send IDV, which is the target server that I want to uh, that I want to access, and a timestamp and the and the ticket. This ticket is to be presented to Eva, to the email server. This is what we say that first we get a ticket to enter to the cinema, and then to get another ticket to access a particular movie. Okay, so this is the ticket that we use to access a particular movie. Type. Once we do this, خلاص, from now on, I just use the, the ticket and the authenticator. Here, but we don't have any target. Uh, we don't have any target server anymore, because all the upcoming communication is going to be with the same server. So I don't, I don't need to access this server to access another server. That's why I don't have any target server here. I always have to present this, the, the ticket and my authenticator. Ticket and my authenticator and anything I want to communicate. That's it. So now we go back to the question that we didn't answer. So why do we need to have ID TGS? In fact, we will see now that we have here ID, uh, IDV and IDV. صح? And we have ID TGS and ID TGS. And we always have this. Why? Uh, the reason is like two things. First, uh, the, the, the authentication or the, 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 the message level authentication has to be mutual. Has to be mutual in the sense that I, I authenticate myself to the server and the server has to authenticate itself back to me. Okay? So that I know that I'm actually talking to the server and not anyone else. Because remember, this will mitigate Eva, the active attack, the spoofing. Okay, so even if the attacker tries to uh, uh, play with the IP address of the machine or something like this, okay, he or she does not know the uh, the key, so he cannot encrypt the message. Meshi, 
So because of the fact that I have the key and I can decrypt the message, I make sure that I'm indeed talking to the ticket granting server and not anyone else. The other reason is that it could, it could actually serve as an acknowledgement. Maybe It could serve as an acknowledgement. So for my request, I'm acknowledging that, okay, I grant you this, uh, this particular request. So it, in fact, it has two implicit functions. But the more important one is mutual authentication. If you, if you take a look at the, uh, at the last message in that regard, you will see that it's actually TS5 plus 1. There's no A. There is no echo of any target server because there's no target server. So the mutual authentication here is done by incrementing just one, which is a little bit interesting. So I'm encrypting the timestamp, and by increasing the timestamp by one, I'm authenticating myself back to the client. Okay? Because I know that I know the timestamp you sent me. If I increment it by one, that's another way of authenticating myself back to you, which is uh, specific to that particular uh, link, and it's different from all the other messages. Because all the other messages, they start with the target server. Okay, so authentic mutual authentication is done uh, here by just incrementing the. That's why here we have, you will see in the in the next slide we have mutual authentication. For the. <coughs> of course, not the ticket granting server, only authentication server. What are? Well, I, what are? Yes. We will see now the ticket granting server. The, the ticket granting server receives the authenticator of the user. This authenticator of the user is actually encrypted with the session key that we have obtained from the previous request. What hadi? So the first step, I'm authenticating the user ID, and I'm, I'm sending the user a puzzle which is encrypted based on the password of the user. If the user indeed has the right password, he will be able to break that puzzle. When he opens that puzzle, he finds the session key that he should use to communicate with the e, with the ticket granting server. If he is successful, he will be able to get another ticket which allows him to e, to access that particular service. Naji? Huh? Anything not clear? Huh? Fadal. No, 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 that, no. Between the client and the authentication server, we send the user ID bus only, okay? So the authentication server will send a session key to the user to communicate with the ticket granting server, okay? Not to not as a, a, a shared key to communicate between the user and the authentication server. No, because both the authentication server and the, the, the ticket granting server, they act as like basic servers to grant any kind of service access to the user. Okay. What hadith? Another thing here that uh, we, should, we should pay attention to, uh, which is coming here, I said, this, in fact, is the authenticator for for the user. So we added to that concept of mutual authentication based on the fact that we echo back the same target server in the request of the in the request message, right? So this acts as two things. First, it acts as acknowledgement and also it acts as mutual authentication. Mutual authentication yani because I'm I'm sending you this target server, okay, that I want to access it. When you send me your ID encrypted inside the message, this tells me that indeed you are the target server I'm, I'm actually requesting. You're not anyone else. Nashi? So this is called mutual authentication. Because this server can be intercepted by any attacker, and the attacker says, okay, I'm the one who, who, whom you want to communicate with. صح? Okay? So somehow, if the attacker gains access to the encrypted message, he cannot really provide that uh, uh, full cycle of mutual authentication. Meshika? 
طيب واي بقى بلس 1 واي بلس 1 ان ذا ان ذا لاست مسج هير بيكوز اي دونت هاف اني تارجت سيرفر سو ذا واي فور ذس از اكشلي ريتن ديتيلد ان ذا ستاندرد يعني سو سو وين اي تراي تو ريد ات اي اسك ماي سيلف واي دو وي هاف بلس 1 هير بيكوز ات لوكس ويرد ات لوكس ا ليتل بيت ويرد صح سو واي بلس واي نوت بلس 2 مثلا ماشي So in the standard, they use it this way to provide mutual authentication based on the fact that I don't have any target server here. Since I don't have any target server in the request, so another way of authenticating the, the, the server is by adding one to the timestamp. Next slide. So this slide hopefully is the last one before we, we stop. So, so this is the request. So this is the reiteration of the same thing. It's just that We need now to break what, what's contained in the tech, uh, ticket and why, and what's contained in that authenticator and why, okay? So the first request, again, is to send the ticket granting server ID and the user ID and the timestamp. That's it. Uh, and the request, sorry, the reply is encrypted with the key based on the user uh, password, and this contains the, uh, the session key And this ID, TGS, again for mutual authentication, the timestamp for replay attack, and a lifetime. Okay? Because as we said, the, uh, uh, the access or granting the access to the ticket granting server has to be for a certain duration of time. So this lifetime applies for the ticket and the key, and the session key. Okay? So this lifetime applies to The key, because it's a session key. A session key means that it has to have a time limit. So if the current time okay, is more than timestamp 2 plus lifetime 2, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. If the current time is more than timestamp 2 plus the lifetime, This means that the, the, the session key has expired, okay? So in that case, the ticket granting server will stop the communication, will not allow any communication with the user. So ticket becomes expired, the, the session key becomes expired. Hello. As we said, the ticket, the ticket granting server, huh? let's back look at it. As we said, the ticket is actually unforgeable uncopyable even by the by the client, by the user himself. So that's why the ticket is actually encrypted using a private key of the ticket granting server. So KC, KC is the private key of the user which is based on the password which is only known by what? By the user and authentication server. The, the key for the ticket granting service, ticket granting server, okay, is only known to the ticket granting server and authentication server. Authentication server knows all these keys. As we said, this is a centralized manager for all these keys. So by doing this, even the client, the user, he has the ticket, but he cannot open it. Okay? And that's on purpose. This is by design. It shouldn't, shouldn't be open. Maybe. So it contains the fact that this user with this ADC. ADC, what is this ADC? ADC is the identifier, not for the user, but identifier for the workstation that this user is actually using. Okay? So the ticket grants the access to this user on this workstation to access a particular server ماشي, for a certain duration of time, which is a IDTGS. So this is coming from the authentication server to tell the user, now you have temporary access for a certain duration of time equal to the lifetime too, okay, to access the ticket granting server for a certain duration of time from that IP address. Aywa. IP address. Uh, and, and I was expecting another question. 
along this lines, but see, you're, 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 at least you are يعني, following, which is, which is good news. But the other question is, eh, where did we get that IP address? It was not sent as part of the request. Aywa. Any guess is fine. Aywa. So the A. From the Yes, salam alaikum. Aywa, kid. Sah. Hey, the people. Hey, the people. Start network one. Double. Akid. Khadu network one. يعني they absorb network one. صحيح. The خد يعني pay attention to the fact that these are application level messages. Okay, these application level messages, when they are exchanged, they have to contain the header, the, the, the MAC header and the network header, okay? So this IP address is, in fact, pulled from the network header. And as we will see later, we cannot encrypt the header. We talked about this before. If the message is encrypted, we cannot encrypt the header for many, many reasons. So this IP header can, in fact, be pulled from the, from the message, from the network header, not from the actual application level message. But we have access to it. So that's the, the request. So similarly, here, the ticket now contains the uh, 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 access for that user, for that workstation, for this particular lifetime, and for that session key. Here, but the authenticator for that user, the authenticator for that user contains an encrypted message which uh, 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 the user is trying to present his credentials to the uh, other uh, server that it tries to access. So it has the uh, authentication, which is the IDC, ADC, and the timestamp three. Okay, so that's the authenticator. That's why, that's why when I here we added to that the A the ADC, which is the IP address of the workstation. And this whole thing is encrypted using the session key. Imagine. So this is, in fact, equivalent to message authentication codes. So this is similar to message, message authentication code. It actually contains the identifier for the user, and it's encrypted using the shared key between the user and the, uh, uh, the target server. Imagine. So this is the uh, this is the second step, and uh, from now on, I don't have any target server here. Alas, I use the ticket authenticator, ticket authenticator, and that's it. And I add to this by any message that I'm trying to communicate to the server, the email content, uh, anything, sending email, getting reply, things like that. So I always have to have those two in addition to all the uh, message content that uh, I need to exchange with the server. Mashika. So this is the detailed uh, protocol, and uh, and as we can see, it does not contain any kind of uh, specific public cryptography or anything to uh, uh, exchange the keys. All of them is based on the symmetric key, and the trick that we have done to do this is by uh, uh, using the uh, puzzle instead of uh, exchanging the password as as plain text. That's a good question. That's arbitrary, so it's up to the developer. It could be actually uh, uh, zero, which means forever. It could be specified as like one minute. But as you can imagine, uh, lifetime two is much bigger than lifetime four, typically. Yani, uh, why is this? Because lifetime two is used to have access to any service. صح? It's agnostic. It's service agnostic. So lifetime two is for the lifetime for the session key that I'm using to uh, uh, communicate with the ticket granting server. صح? So this is agnostic of any service. So typically, in practice, lifetime two is much bigger compared to lifetime four. Why? to facilitate the fact that if the user accesses now email and after one hour tries to access uh, a, a database or tries to access another uh, service, okay, 
he doesn't have to go back from step one. He can still use the same session key of the ticket granting server and request the ticket granting server to get access to another service. Maji, without having to present his or her credentials again and again and again. What, what hadi wallah? So typically, lifetime two is much bigger compared to lifetime four. Could be in the order of like tens, tens of times. Any other questions? Uh, questions indicate to me that people are following, which is good. If I don't get questions, then uh, people are, they have no aywa. Okay. Ten <laughs> kira. Uh, yes, yes, I talked about this because we, we use any, uh, any questions? Type. Uh, Hena ba'a key distribution using asymmetric uh, uh, encryption, which is, as we will see, it's, it's a little bit simpler, Maji, but it's completely different. So because of the fact that we, we need to make it pure uh, 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 symmetric encryption for key distribution, we had to go through this ticketing and, and stuff like that. But here it's much simpler, as we will see, uh, but not trivial. So the overhead is still there, but definitely using uh, uh, asymmetric or public cryptography simplifies the process of uh, key distribution significantly. So we'll talk about this next time, Sean. Any questions? 